All right, so I think we are live and we've got folks coming in. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Sarasota Tiger Bay. It's great to have all of you all joining us this afternoon. Um, certainly, we want to continue our programming, and we've done a really good job of continuing that through Zoom. I want to give a shout out to Kevin Cooper, our chair, and also Morgan Bentley for helping to provide some great programming along with us throughout this time. And certainly, we're in a great season and no lack of content. And so, uh, as you all are coming on today, just know that we're excited to have um, the District 3 for County Commission in front of us with the two contenders um, sitting as the incumbent, uh, Commissioner Nancy Dieter um, coming in for her second term. And also we have someone up against her, which is unusual. Nancy's not accustomed to having a competitor in some of her races. And so we're delighted to have um, Corey Hutchinson joining us as well. So I'm just gonna give one more uh, little second here to let all the other folks join in on the, um, the meeting today, but we certainly are excited to have you all with us. Um, as a reminder, just so you all know, again, as a Sarasota Tiger Bay meeting, uh, we really do um, ensure and wanna make sure we protect the integrity of our Sarasota Tiger Bay meetings. And so um, in the chat box and the question box, we certainly welcome your questions. We ask that your commentaries are kind of put on hold since um, as in all of our meetings, we do ask that only Sarasota Tiger Bay members post questions to the panelists. And so we've got Morgan Bentley behind the wheel um, today for me driving, and he will help us see when you have some questions. So don't hesitate at any point during this program to put your questions in the chat box or in the Q&A and we'll make sure we give you all the opportunity to go live and ask those questions. So on that note, um, I'm Jennifer Vine and I'm serving as your moderator today. And I wanna provide some quick introductions again, as we have incumbent commissioner, Nancy Dieter, joining along with the competitor, um, Corey Hutchinson. So uh, in, in just a short bio of the two candidates and welcome to both of you, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so Commissioner Dieter, a short bio on uh, Nancy. She was born and raised in Chicago. She and her family have been in Florida since 1978. All of her sons, her three kids, have graduated from Venice and USF, and they still live here with their families, where she is a proud grandma to nine grandchildren. Commissioner Dieter has a very uh, distinguished career in public service. We certainly give our tip our hat to that. And uh, she was elected um, to the Sarasota County Commissioner um, Commission Office in 2016. And prior to that, she served in the Florida House of Representatives. She served in the Florida Senate, uh, the Sarasota County School Board, Enterprise Florida Board of Directors, and the Florida Commission on Tourism. So certainly she has a longstanding public service record, and we commend her for all of that work. She also uh, started the Osprey Mortgage Company in 1983 and served as president of that corporation until she sold the business in 2007. She is now seeking to retain her seat representing District 3 for County Commission. And so then we also have Corey Hutchinson with us and welcome again, Corey. As a Sarasota County uh, native, you uh, live and reside in Northport. You a proud homeowner with your fiance in Northport, I think you certainly represent the South County well. You hold a master's degree in business administration. You are the current chairperson of the Northport Charter Review Board, and you're president of a local mental health nonprofit called Holly's Hope. Uh, you are currently employed by the Sarasota County School District, where you work as a college and career advisor at Laurel Nokomis School. So again, welcome to both. We're already getting, I think I see questions are already starting to pop up. So that's really good to, good to know. Um, all right, so again, we're gonna just cover um, a couple of different issues. We're gonna, the way the format will run is I'll just tip some questions posing both to candidates for their response. We'll go back and forth. We'll cover various issues, topics of um, current importance, maybe some philosophical um, stances on some things. We're certainly gonna pivot to some lightning rounds. We might do a little trivia testing your history and understanding of the county. Um, and then we'll certainly allow you all the opportunity to um, provide um, a summation of why you really are the one qualified to continue to serve or to, or to serve 
as the Sarasota County Commissioner for District 3. All right, fair enough? Yep. Are we good? Okay. All right, I'll start with some softballs and then we'll kind of meander back and forth. And so, Corey, I will start with you. I'd like to find out what are the three things that you hope to accomplish during your term if selected as the county commissioner? Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer, for moderating this meeting and thank you to everyone for attending. Uh, one of the highest priorities has to be our environment and ensuring that we protect our environment moving forward. This involves clean water standards, ensuring that we are looking forward to renewable energy sources. The state of Florida and our county especially can take such high advantage of using renewable energy sources like solar through grants as the city of Venice was able to obtain for their city. That's got to be priority number one. Along with that is infrastructure we have to invest in our infrastructure. And that means working with our state leaders, federal leaders to obtain grants and funding to help with this. Unfortunately, we have seen millions of gallons of sewage spill into our water. And that's going to eventually cause irreparable damage. If our environment fails, our economy will go down with it. We must prioritize the environment and along with that is infrastructure. Part of that is restoring our 2050 plan. Unfortunately, a lot of what we have had has been cast to the side. We need to restore that plan, modify what needs to be modified for the future, and really put teeth into it so that way we follow it and understand that it is a community vision for the future. So environment, infrastructure, restoring the 2050 plan, bringing back those community conversations, that's what we need to do. And if we can accomplish that in the first four years, that would be a huge success. Part of that 2050 plan will be a smart growth initiative to where we prioritize a balance between growth and preservation, using our zoning and land use to ensure that we don't have urban sprawl that overloads our infrastructure, which is already happening, and we don't have urban sprawl that is going to cause us consequences in the future. Thank you, Corey. Nancy, um, same question to you. What do you hope to accomplish as your top three priorities? Well, I think we all moved here because it is paradise and our main challenge is protect the paradise that we live in. I think that our staff in the county has done that. They, they've done a yeoman's job with very few people. I think the top priority is air and water. I mean, we saw during the red tide period if you can't breathe the air, everything else kind of doesn't matter. You can't go to the beach, you can't be outside. We're experiencing that with COVID too, but so we have to do everything we can to protect our air and water. And we are doing that. And we have been doing that. I've been doing that for years. Um, on the environment, I, I did the coral reef plate as a legislator and that, that money goes solely to moat for coral reef research, and they're doing a great job. You might have seen the article in the paper about installing things under people's docks for, for uh, man-made reefs, which is a pretty interesting concept. As a county, we are supporting Moats Aquarium and investing money and helping them get that off the ground. They currently have around 350,000 visitors a year at their hard to find location. So at the new location, which will be out at Benderson Park, they'll probably get over a million visitors to that aquarium. But the beauty of putting the aquarium out there is we free up their current space totally for research. That should be like a woods hole. That is a, a total gem for us. There's been a lot of talk about um, sewage spillage, which was mainly manatee. We've had um, water spillage, but it's generally been treated, recycled water. Uh, we're spending, this county voted over a year ago to take on a debt of $300 million to have advanced waste water treatment centers. So it's no longer good enough to just treat it and then we used to sell that water to golf courses to be used. Um, they don't even want to buy it anymore because 
we've upped the game on how many nutrients can be in the water. So we are switching to advanced water treatment centers and taking on that debt it was pretty brave of us. It's not a, talking about sewage is never a glitzy item. It doesn't look great on your brochure for your next campaign, but I applaud our county administrator for pointing out how we can stay ahead of the game. So we are doing that. And then affordable housing is always a problem. I went to a seminar put on by the EDC and they brought in a national consultant. And she said, you have three problems in Sarasota, traffic, affordable housing, and low paying jobs. And then she followed it up and said, you could probably drop me from a helicopter in any community in the country and I can give this same speech. So we do see that we have national issues. And I just think that we have spent, we have streamlined our government. We have lower taxes, but because of the appreciation of the property, we have plenty of money to work with and we're, we are putting it into infrastructure and all the things that, that will keep us safe. Thank you both for answering those questions. And you certainly touched on some things that I'll drill down a little bit more on, uh, whether it's the public-private partnerships, whether it's the comp plan. So we'll get to all of those in just a minute, but I'm curious to hear from you both. Um, and Corey, again, I'll tip this over to you first, is what have you learned? What lessons do you think have been gained through the COVID experience? And how do you think it will shape your thinking going forward as a county commissioner? How it may have shaped your thinking and how it may have changed or altered things that were a priority before and now may be different. The COVID experience has brought a lot of things to my mind. Number one is um, truly how much need there is in our community. We have seen how much the food banks and our nonprofits have stepped up to provide for our residents who went without paychecks and, and needed those um, food services. We saw our school and district provide a lot of free meals. And it was in the tens of thousands of people that are taking advantage of those programs. So that really shows you that when our economy is good, it's good, but it's also very fragile. So I think we need to look forward into that mindset, mindset excuse me, of diversifying our economy, making it to where we don't have just one or two major industries, but trying to diversify it to other industries. That's not something that happens overnight. It will take a lot of partnerships, but I believe that we can do that. Another thing is mental health. We have seen um, an increase in cases as far as calls to the suicide hotline, calls to uh, mental health services, and we still don't have an increase in those services here as far as our county goes. We need to bring that initiative back to the ballot for our citizens to vote on. It should have still remained on for this year to vote on that mental health district. That way it would have been up to the citizens if they wanted it or not, and if they wanted that expense or not. Mental health services are critical to our community. We must do better, and even as a whole state, but we have to do better as a community in providing mental health services. It can't be all on the backs of the nonprofits. We need to ensure that there's accountability and oversight to that as well, so that way it succeeds. And one of the things I found in working with a lot of youth with mental health, um, with my nonprofit, is that there is a huge youth need for mental health and a huge need within our elderly population as well. We need to come up with creative solutions to meet them where they are. It's very hard to always get people to come out and, and, and say what's going on. Sometimes you have to go to them. So having those community conversations, town halls with residents, finding out those direct needs is going to be extremely important moving forward. And those are some of the biggest lessons that I've learned through uh, COVID. Thank you, Corey. What about you, Nancy? Um, hmm. We have, I, I was listening to Corey and kind of making some notes. Um, we are, we just got $18.5 million from the federal government to help us with COVID expenses. Our county has spent over $4 million just on testing sites so that we can serve our community in that way. 
we will be able with the federal funds to reimburse the county out of that money, what we're out of pocket. And we have had our first meeting as to what are the priorities in dispersing that money because we have to get it out to the public by the end of December, $18.5 million. And we have dedicated uh, a great chunk of that money to food banks and to provide food for people to um, help them with their rent and mortgages so they can hang on to the roof over their head. I think what COVID has, the lesson I take from COVID, two things really I've always known as a mortgage broker, I know what people make in this community. I mean, mortgage brokers know more than your family members because we see your credit report. We know, we see your W-2. We know how much you make and how much you spend and what you spend it on and what do you have left over. We know all of it. And a lot of people are on a real thin margin. They're spending more than 50% of their income on housing and that makes it hard to have money for other things. So the two things I've learned is, you know, the need of the working class. And frankly, I've been immensely impressed with the cheerful attitude of our young workers. Um, they're just rolling with the punches and doing the best they can. And I'm not hearing a whole lot of whining about it. They would like their jobs back. They'd like to go back to work. They'd like to get back to normal. Uh, I think they're having the toughest time of any generation I've ever seen. And the county is doing everything it can to help them with their jobs and their expenses. And once we get past this $18.5 million first spend by the end of December, we then will have another $56 million. So we'll see what we do that with that. But that those federal dollars have really kept, a, kept it from being the total burden of local government. And so let me just pivot a little bit then um, as to talk about the budget, the implications, um, and what do you see in the future? And I think I'll bring this to Commissioner Dieter to speak to first. Um, and here's a little trivia question. Um, what is our um, tentative 2021 budget amount? Do both of you all know this number? Both of you got the budget number? I certainly do because we just went through budget meetings. Yeah, Corey, you got the number? Do you know what the budget is? What are we looking at? Uh, let me, I had it in my notes on the side right here. That's I, all right. I, I have the 2020 at 1.3 billion. And then our 2021, um, pretty close to that. We're sitting at what, at 1.3-ish billion? 1.3. 1.3, Commissioner? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so so what do you see um, kind of coming forward and what will shift your decision making um, in terms of the prioritization because of some of the budget implications? How would you address that, Commissioner Dieter? Well, I think the shocking thing about sitting through the budget meetings is, and your questions kind of reflect what people think, in a crisis like this, they expect cutbacks, budget shortfalls, higher taxes, fewer projects. We pretty much have an even budget. We put a few things on pause. We're taking a very hard look at the Bayfront Conservatory because while we don't chip in on that, it would be a hundred million dollar cost to us over a 30 year period in lost revenue, which isn't the same as us paying it out. We're just waiving that money and letting it go to the Bayfront. Uh, it, the crisis will not affect our, our investment in moat. We've just paid $50 million, took out a loan for the legacy trail. No effect there. So between our, one thing we did, when I first got on the board, they had a 30-day rainy day fund, and that didn't sound like enough to me. 
So we went to a 75 day rainy day fund. And then we also started a second fund, which I forget what cutesy title we gave it, something like resiliency fund or emergency fund. And we were thinking hurricanes at the time, but now it turns out that COVID is the crisis, not a hurricane. And our county is well positioned to have no cuts, um, no layoffs, and pretty much business as usual. We, we have a really streamlined county of hard workers. Um, just our board, five member board, we've got uh, two secretaries. One of them is for three of us and the other one is for two of us. You compare that to other counties, they have a legislative personal assistant, they all have their own secretary, a whole bureaucracy. You know, we make do with what we have and get the job done and Thank try you. to stay ahead of the game. I think it's going Thank well. You. And Corey, what would, what would you do in terms of uh, the budget and the implications because of, that may come into play because of COVID? I want to ensure that all of the needs of our residents are met first. So this ensures that we don't have to take any cuts in first responder services, um, ensuring that we have the staff that we need to perform the city services and ensuring that we can keep all that running smoothly. The next thing is our, the needs of our community. So that is what money do we have dedicated for the future for infrastructure that we're going to need for um, necessary road repairs for the necessary functions of our county. Outside of that, then we move into the projects and the things that we have wanted to do. If you still have money in the budget and you can still do those items, that is a wonderful thing. I think that we also need to look at not just um, dispensing the CARES Act funds, but also how we help our small businesses moving forward post COVID. I think there are some things that we can learn as to supporting our small businesses. They are truly the backbone of this community and one of the main reasons why people want to travel here. So helping our small businesses as they continue to recover, not just with the CARES Act funding, but beyond that, having a mental health district is extremely critical to this community. So we need to look into how we can budget for that. Um, we also need to look into how we can budget to fix infrastructure by making development pay for itself. Um, it's all well and good when you keep the taxes low, but if utility rates and other assessments and fees go up to pay for expenses, you're not really saving the residents any money. And we need to understand that it's important that growth pays for itself moving forward by having our impact fees set at 100%. This ensures that taxpayers are not subsidizing any new development, which they should not be. Those are gonna be critical because the budget might look good now, next year's could be hit even worse once the full ramifications of COVID come in. And we need to ensure that we don't have a shortfall. Setting the policy in place to prevent that is going to be a key between now and the next budget. So Corey, just to further that, with um, as I'm looking at the, the board policy agenda, kind of what they set forth as their top priorities. Um, I, I heard a lot of consistency in Nancy's, um, Commissioner Dieter's responses. Um, I'm curious to hear, like you, you brought up um, helping the small businesses, the mental health district, of the what's been identified with the county as their top priorities, would you shift any of those? Would you reshuffle the deck a little bit? What would become kind of your highest priority, Corey? The highest priority right now needs to be infrastructure, mental health, environment, small business. That's what needs to be the top priorities. After that, we can work on other things. The issue is, is that those priorities go into so much of what spills into everything else. If we don't take care of that first and those needs first, a lot of the things that we're going to try to do for other areas of our county aren't going to be successful. We need to make sure that we have infrastructure plans moving forward. And the problem is that the 300 million going to this, that's a debt, didn't have to be a debt if it was planned for properly in the past. So we need to create these plans moving forward. We need to ensure that our environment is protected because all the nice tourism that we're going to get from some of these projects 
isn't going to matter if we don't make that a standard. Mental health has always been a need. It's become even more of one through the COVID pandemic. Having that funded and moving forward with that is going to be extremely important. It can't always be on the backs of the nonprofits, although they do do a very good job. So those are our top priorities. And then helping our, our small businesses as they recover from COVID, not just this year, but next year and the years after as well. And then a um, little bit of a lightning round here. So I just want a yes or no question um, from you on this, because this was mentioned, uh, Commissioner Dieter, you, you uh, brought this forward, was the Bayfront Project. Um, do you support the Bayfront Project, yes or no? What's your position on that, yes or no? Yes. Yes. Corey? Not at this time. You do not support Bayfront Project. Okay, thank you for that clarity and the response. I appreciate that very much. Um, all right, let me just take a quick peek, see if there's any other questions. Let's see. Oh, yes. All right, I've got a question from the group. Um, wanted me to um, push, push this out to both of you all. So could you both in, uh, indicate to me or to all of us, why is it so important to redistrict this year before the census count? Um, why was there that sense of urgency in doing that? Um, Corey, let me start with you. Um, did you think that they should have redistricted or should have waited? No, it should have waited until the 2020 <laughs> census. We know that the census numbers that we get are the most accurate numbers as far as population data that you can have. Um, that is the basis by which um, state statute sets how you should redistrict for municipalities and counties as well. Um, this is quite frankly a very unfortunate um, incident that has occurred. There were many community conversations. There were hundreds of public commenters, not just at the meetings, but that sent in emails and made their voices heard that this shouldn't happen. We all know that redistricting is necessary at certain times based on population differences, but it should occur at a census, especially with the fact that we have a census this year. It didn't have to be done in 2019 with a census upcoming. The unfortunate part is that our community spoke and said, we don't want this, we don't like what you're doing, and they did it anyway. And it went to a judge under a lawsuit. The judge in his ruling, which is public record, um, called it political hardball, essentially a political games. And unfortunately, the Supreme Court allows for that but that doesn't mean that we have to accept it in this community. It's very unfortunate that the author of the map that was adopted is a convicted political criminal. So the integrity of the redistricting process, the fact that they adopted a map used by a convicted political criminal, um, that should toss out this process to start with. It is extremely disheartening that the um, county commission went to this length to um, not go with the will of the people. And especially with the single member districts, everybody wanted that, it passed 60%. And we had great districts going into this election. The county staff indicated that there was not a problem, but that wasn't satisfactory enough. So they hired a consultant. You wanna talk about tax dollars, they wasted $50,000 on the consultant that could have been used for something else. And now we have an election that um, is unfortunate because of this redistricting. So it's absolutely not a good thing. It needs to not happen again. And we need to send a message loud and clear that those type of actions going against the will of the community will not be tolerated in Sarasota County. So you're in support of single member districts, wanted to wait until after the census and felt that the process um, had did not have a fidelity to it. Is that fair? Okay. Uh, and Commissioner Dieter, if you could respond to the single member district, the sense of urgency of doing it, the redistricting now versus post the census count. Oh, okay. And in the interest of fairness, I intend to, tend to take just as much time explaining the facts because what you just heard is right out of the political party that he attends that those are their talking points. The voters voted for single member districts. I don't like them. I don't think it's a great idea and you'll see why in a second. Uh, single member districts say that right now you've got three county commission seats up for election. 
two districts, single member districts, won't get to vote for any county commissioner. The other districts get to vote for one. Under our old system, everybody in the county would have voted for three. Mr. Hutchinson and I are both live in South County, so our district is, you know, Venice, a little piece of Northport, Nokomis, whatever. That's the district. You just asked us about the Bayfront Project. We don't have to care about the Bayfront Project anymore. If I love the Bayfront Project and all the people that love it love me back, they don't live in my district. I only have to love stuff in Venice or Northport. You see the problem there. We're going to become very territorial. So why did we do re redistricting? We should have waited for the census numbers. Well, that's hilarious to me. As soon as you pass single member districts, the count that was used is 312,000 people because it was a 10 year old count. So we all know there's 426,000 people in the county. So I don't like single member districts. I don't have to like them. The voters liked it, it passed. Uh, so I felt all five districts should at least have an equal amount of residents in them my district was 10,000 people different than Commissioner Hines's district because before it didn't make any difference. Everybody in the county was going to vote. You had to live in a certain part of the county to run, but it didn't make any difference how many people were in each district. And it was off by that much. Legally, if you're off by 10%, you have to redistrict to be fair. And the Florida state statutes say you have to come as close to zero difference as you can possibly get. They actually use the number zero. And then to say, wait for the 2020 census numbers is a red herring, frankly, because the 2020 census comes out in 2020, you can only redistrict in odd numbered years. So one party liked single member districts, they had their eye on one district, they had their candidate ready to go. And then when we did a different map, their candidate didn't live there. And nobody in his district is going to be voting for any county commissioner. So I just felt it was fair. If you're going to have single member districts, they all need to be equal. You can only redistrict in odd numbered years, not even numbered years. And that's why we did it. And as to who submitted a map and the man's a convicted felon. I don't care who's, you. the same party likes convicted felons to vote, so why couldn't they draw a map while they're at it? I kept saying, I, I knew what was gonna happen with redistricting. It's like the third rail of politics. It brings out all kinds of people wearing t-shirts and carrying a sign. Every time we had a meeting, I said, everyone in the county is invited to draw their own map hand draw it and send it in. We had a way that you could do that by computer. You could drop it off. I expected to see a map from the League of Women Voters. Didn't get one. I expected to see a map from the Democratic Party. Didn't get one. We only had like five or six people submit a map. Okay, so let me just, in summary then, Commissioner, you are not in favor of single member districts. You felt that we needed to do the count prior and the fidelity of the process was met your expectations. So I think that's a very, exactly. okay. Then I think that, that's a nicer way to put it. pardon? That's a nicer way to put it than how I put it. Well, I was just trying to be clear on the, where the differentiating points are between the two candidates. So Corey, knowing that this was completely different than where your stance is, do you want to provide any a rebuttal to that or anything at all, just to round that out. Yeah, I want to just say that 14 of 16, 14 out of 16 of the largest counties in the state of Florida use a single member district system. So this is not something that is unheard of. Um, if you get good elected officials in office, they will care about every aspect of the county. While yes, my district is in Northport, Venice and Nokomis, I care just as much about Sarasota as I do down here. And those people in the t-shirts that were waving the signs are dedicated community members that wanted to have their voice heard and were disrespected at every opportunity. 
and it's very unfortunate. Um, you can finish the maps in 2021 and we would be just fine. There's no reason why this had to happen. It's not the fault of my party or your party or the League of Women Voters or anyone else. Okay, thank you very much. And I think we've got another question that's coming uh, that we want to bring live. So um, Morgan, can you bring Ken Sheelan up in to ask the question live? Let's see if Ken is available. Oh, there he is. So Ken, can you hear us now? You just unmic your, the floor is yours to ask the question. Sorry, I didn't see that. Um, my question is, why hasn't Sarasota County adopted uh, non-discrimination protections for the LGBT community as the city of Sarasota, the city of Venice, and the city of Northport all have? And Ken, do you want both um, folks to answer that question? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, Commissioner Dieter, I'll start with you. Thank you, Ken. Uh, Ken, we've worked on issues like that before, you and I. Um, I'm happy to work on that issue. We've been a little busy with COVID and other things, so we just haven't gotten around to it yet. Okay. And Corey, your response to that. Um, I'm in full support of a human rights ordinance. We need it at the county level like our cities have, and it um, would be wonderful if this movement spreads across the state of Florida. I will work um, hard if elected to get a human rights ordinance passed. It's extremely important that we let everyone in Sarasota County know that we care about all of our people, regardless of gender, identity, race, or anything else. I'm in full support of that and will work toward getting that done. Thank you. And looking at another question from the audience, Tiger Bay member Ann Rawlings um, pitched a question. I'm going to uh, share it with you. It was in the chat box. So it says, uh, Florida Amendment 2 would impose a mandatory increase of the Florida minimum wage to $15 an hour. Small businesses are concerned about their ability to absorb uh, this labor expense after the devastating effects of the pandemic. Although this issue is not voted upon by the county commissioners, where do you stand on Amendment to. So Corey, I will start with you. Where do you stand on that? I would prefer that this not pass across the state only for the fact that I want to see a minimum wage being able to be handled at the local level. So I would like for this amendment to have included each county and city the ability to direct the minimum wage as they see fit, which is currently not permitted under state statute. Uh, because it does not have that in there, I feel that there's going to be, it's not going to do enough, number one, to help the counties that really need a higher wage because of their cost of living, and it will hurt the more rural counties. So I will only support this when it includes um, it being local control and not all the way across the state. Okay. Commissioner Dieter, where do you stand on Amendment 2? Um, I would be a no on it. I think it's going to cost people jobs um, to order businesses to pay $15 an hour. I think we can all see how quick they'll move to technology. If you go to the, it would affect our low end workers the most and it, they would lose jobs. One can see that if you pulled up to McDonald's, you, you just have a touch screen to place your own order. So the person at window one would be gone and you'd only have the person at window two that would collect and give you your food. So um, the, the first time this was proposed, it was $10 an hour and now it's 15. So once you, I have two sons and they're both employers and they say, people that are start out at minimum wage, if you're any good at all within 90 days, you're no longer making minimum wage even dishwashers. Thank you for your responses on that. So uh, switching gears again, just a little bit. Um, oh, and here's a trivia. I'm just so curious. Uh, how many uh, employees does the county commission appoint? Appoint? Appoint. Well, if they're appointed, they're not employees. Is it a trick question? They would designate them. They would designate two. There's two. There's two, county administrator, county attorney. Is that fair? Yes. Really, 
Yeah, okay. Oh, how many do we, yeah, actually. I did my little civics uh, 101 through the county. I really enjoyed that actually. So um, I like these trivia challenges. Um, so let me switch gears though, and let's talk about the comp plan. Um, the comprehensive plan uh, 2050, Sarasota 2050. Um, and I think there are some things that are certainly um, of strong opinion right now that are out there, but wanting to know Again, um, more on the position. If you want to get specific, that's great. Um, but really wanting to understand the balance between the urban sprawl, the density, uh, environment protection, preservations. How do you strike that balance? So I'm kind of going from an angle of a philosophical approach, but you certainly can get very specific should you so choose. So um, Corey, I will start with you. It's extremely important that we do work toward this balance. Um, what we need to understand is that there are parts of the county, especially like Old Mayaka, that want to keep the country country. They want their area of rural life preserved. There are other areas of the county where that's not important. They have other priorities for their community. So we really need to incorporate that and actually take it to heart. Um, there have been many more proposals recently to build high density out there east of 75 in those rural areas. I don't think that's what that community wants to see out there. And the way that we need to go about kind of ensuring we don't have urban sprawl, which causes many consequences, we have to be able to work with our zoning and our land use to change some of that to ensure that we do prioritize that preservation. Communities that prioritize their green space have um, high quality of life rankings. They have uh, extreme happiness among their citizens who tour their parks and their amenities because they embrace the community and embrace the green space and the natural resources instead of working against it. This also helps development because when you develop on land that is environmentally sensitive, your development can have a lot of consequences too because that land's just not so suited for that type of development. We need to ensure always that the celery fields remain protected, that we protect our critical environmental lands, the ones especially that lead to our water sources, the ones that are responsible um, for our aquifers. We need to work as well to have town halls and community conversations at different parts of our district. And the reason why I wanna do that is to ensure that we get feedback from every corner of the county, that way we are truly making this comp plan moving forward, the community conversation that it started as. We will uh, make advancements toward renewable energy. That's extremely important. We will ensure that urban sprawl does not uh, force the consequences of overbearing the infrastructure and the traffic grids, which unfortunately we're already seeing those consequences because of poor planning from the past. So we need to make sure that that's a priority. You have to think about those needs and infrastructure and in planning, they're not the most fun things to talk about all the time. They don't um, excite people always, but those are the needs of the community that we have to look forward to. Extremely critical that we preserve our green space have the balance there and um, ensure that what our residents want is what they are getting. Thank you. And Commissioner Dieter, how would you respond to that same question? Okay. Um, number one, I was the tie vote that saved the salary bills. It, it passed three to two. So I'm very proud of that and uh, it was the right thing to do at the time. Uh, talking about the comp plan I-75, when it was first put in, that was supposed to be the line of demarcation and you had to have infill before you could even go out there. But everybody went out there anyway, and including places that preserve the environment in their development, like the Founders Club, which has a lot of green space and other, other developments that have uh, worked to preserve the environment. One of the things we can be proud of is probably a third of the county is will be kept pristine due to our environmentally sensitive land purchases. And we buy up little pockets and we buy up big pockets. And we've had a lot of um, collaboration with environmental groups. And we have committees that 
you know, will recommend and we, we buy those lands so that we can keep them forever, mainly for drainage and water and filling up the aquifer. One thing about solar, we already have that too. We have a PACE program that people might not know about. If you wanted to make your house completely solar or you want to have a solar hot water heater or whatever, uh, there's a program that's available whereby you can finance it and the money is added to your taxes and we kind of serve as the financing arm, not that we get paid, but we do collect the fees for that. And that's been touted by a lot of groups as the way to go, because as we know, to make your house solar, the upfront expense is very costly. So I think we've explored every avenue. We have the same goals, uh, which is to, to keep our paradise. I think we're doing it. That's terrific. And thank you both for your responses. I'm going to go live in just a second with another question, but I want to stay on this topic since someone had put in the post in the chat box something related to this. Um, and so uh, this is for both of you. It's really to, um, this is from Tom Matrullo. Um, how could the county organize planning and development data in a way that the public can understand what housing, commercial, and school development is already approved, how much is being processed, and how much is on the drawing boards? And the purpose of which is to enable public comprehension and discussion of the direction, rate, and likely outcomes of increased intensity and density. So just how can you, how can we better inform the public so there's an engaged conversation in within that whole process? So Commissioner Dieter, I'll start with you. Well, Tom certainly knows how it goes. I, I met with him originally on a Bee Ridge project and helped um, have, have worked with him on other things. I think the general public is not really interested in all that dry material. If they are, it's on our website. Uh, we, we go to great lengths to put out press releases to try to keep the public informed about anything that they ought to know about, including every time we rezone something, there's always an ad in the paper which says the county meeting or the planning board meeting will be held at such and such. So the information is available. We're highly transparent. Um, I think a good 50% of our residents are too busy working their jobs and going so to- you can change anything. Every, you feel like the communication channels are sufficient. I think, I think we're doing it. We, we okay, do it. fair enough in every media. Okay, and what about you, Corey? Um, would you say the same thing or would you do anything differently? I think we need to increase or, or make better our efficiency at which we spread our message. One of the things, um, issues that I've had with uh, many governments at the local level is that the technology and the way that you have to navigate the websites is somewhat antiquated in my opinion. Um, it, placing ads in the newspaper are good, unfortunately. We have declining newspaper usage, so that only reaches so many people. Number one, I plan to host many town halls, not just um, in person when appropriate, but also virtually as well. And we will discuss, of course, within all parameters of Sunshine Law, um, things that are going on, especially that are important to the communities that I represent. Not only that, but increasing our ability on our website and our technology use to make it easy. Uh, Commissioner Dieter, it's right that many people are working their jobs and they don't have a whole lot of time to navigate. So we don't want to have hurdles in place to where you have to click through seven different things to get to something. There are a lot of residents that are interested in learning about this and they don't have always the time to look at it and I don't blame them. Everybody's busy working your jobs, taking care of family. So we need to really create a portal on our website, work with IT to make it as user friendly as possible. There are a few governments um, that, that do a very good job at making not just data transparent, but also very easy to access, very easy and simple to look at and read. And that's what we need to do as far as our technology displays go. Community conversations, the town halls, those are critical for the groups that don't use technology and just for anybody that wants to come and see you face to face and speak with you and really share their concerns. 
Thank you. And now I think we're going to go live again uh, with a question. We've got Dennis Reese. Um, Dennis, you just unmute yourself and have at it. Great. Thank you so much. Um, the city of Sarasota and the Manatee County Commission have both endorsed the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, I understand that the Sarasota County Commission wouldn't even um, take it up. So I'd like to ask both candidates if it were to come, uh, a request would come to the county to look at this again, where would you stand? Who do you want to start? I'll go. It came to the county. I, I voted. I voted for it, and I lost four to one. I will support an equal rights amendment and vote to support it. I like this clear distinction. Um, this is helping us wade through all of this uh, conversation. All right, so here's another lightning round. So you just say yes or no on this one. Is uh, should there be a mask ordinance in uh, Sarasota County for COVID? Should it be required? Yes or no, Commissioner Dieter? We have one. Yes. There we go. And Corey? Yes, there should be a mask ordinance. Excellent. All right, so let's move on to some other questions from the audience. And let me just zone. Oh, this is a very, Erica, you asked a very long um question my gosh hold on a second here let me try to sum surmise um okay this is about a rezone pe petition um this zoning issue that the county admitted was an error i'm scrolling through the notes because i want to make sure it's a it's a question that's applicable to both not just um in the decision in a, as a sitting commissioner um so Let's see, say that there was a board and no, no, we never had out. All right, um, Eric, I'm just going to pitch it back to you. If you can uh, reframe those questions for us, I think that'd be really helpful so that it is applicable to both candidates to um, respond. I think that would be really helpful. Okay, so moving on, let's talk a little bit about your philosophical positions in governing. Um, when you think about serving as a public servant, um, what are the, you know, uh, your political philosophies really serve as kind of your guideposts. They really light your way, set your path, regardless of what the topical issues of the current day are. So as you look back um, and look at what has formed and developed your philosophies, um, what has been your kind of your guiding post for you along the way? And so Commissioner Dieter, let me start with you on that. Oh, I was hoping to go second on that one. I have a lot of <laughs> And I've had a lot of different jobs, <laughs> which to execute them. Um, my philosophy as a public servant is that it is an immense honor to be chosen to represent the people. Um, I'm not a populist. I don't just like cave to every crowd, and, but I do try to help people who come and visit me. Some of the best bills I ever did start out with a person walked into my office. So one, one person can still change history and change life. And I don't mean I'm the one person. I mean the person who walked into my office and told me their tale. So the main thing is to be a listener. Um, the philosophy that pushes me the most is I think the, I've lived here so long. I know the people who live here. I give lots of speeches, try to stay in touch so that I can be the best representative of the residents that I can be. And Corey, to you. Uh, my philosophy is that when you are an elected official, you are a public trust. The public should learn to trust you through what you say, but also what you do. And it is an honor to, um, to just think about being a public official and think about serving my community. Community service is a huge part of who I am. That's why I work with students because I enjoy working with our community and our families. It's why I have the, the nonprofit in Northport that's focused on mental health. It's why I joined the Charter Review Board in Northport. I believe in doing as much good as I can for my community as, as I can. Public comment, ensuring that people always have the right to speak and ensuring that your meetings are transparent, ensuring that I as an individual am, am always transparent. Even if you don't always like what I say, 
but you should know not only what I do, but why I do it, why I vote the way I vote, and why I think the way I think. My commitment to you is to be open and transparent, to hold town hall meetings, to answer to uh, you, the people, not development and special interest, but I will always be your voice. I wanna show you through my actions that I care, that I love this community, and that's why I choose to live here. I want to show you that I care very much about the portions of our community that want to preserve green space. I believe that out of control development does more harm than good for a community. And I believe so much that what the people decide and what the people want is what goes. It's not about my agenda. It's about your agenda as citizens of this county. So I hope to show you that if I'm fortunate enough to be elected and I hope to make everybody proud through my time in public service. You come, do your service, and then head back to private life. That's the way government was of, by, and for the people. Or you preempted the stump speech. We didn't do that yet. I was just asking about the philosophy. You really just gave a nice, good uh, summation of why we should vote for you. So I am kind of curious to hear a little bit about from both of you all. So Commissioner Dieter, I'll ask you first. Um, what do you think are the distinct differences between the two of you and why should voters vote for you over Corey? Well, frankly, after that stump speech, I'm voting for Corey. I mean, that was just spectacular. <laughs> you have convinced me that my life has been in vain. Um, I, I think that when you get elected, um, Issues change every six months. People try to run on issues. The issues are gonna change. The person is not gonna change. So what, what is your value to the organization? What do you bring to the table that's valuable to your constituents? It can be as simple as your life experiences. You've had a tragedy, you have a handicapped kid, whatever it is that compels you to run, that's great. Uh, your knowledge of the community, and whatever special skills you have. And why I find politics so interesting, and I've owned a, owned a business for 25 years that I loved my business, but when it comes to politics, you have everything changes every day, and you have to use every skill you have. So it's, it's pretty fascinating. So I think that's what I bring is lots of experiences and life experiences, business experiences, along with other things. Thank you, Commissioner. And Corey, again, just the question of the differences, what do you think are the unique differences um, that separate the two of you all and, and why you? Well, I think uh, both of us have been in this community for a long time. Uh, this has been me where I've grown up. But I believe that it's time to pass the torch to the future and to the next generation of leaders. The future is at stake and what we do moving forward will be critical to how our county moves forward in the next years and the next decades. You need somebody who is going to only be beholden to the public. Um, I don't have any political ties that would hold me back or hold me down from voting for citizen best interest I don't have political experience that says this is the politician way to do it. I do it the way that it should be done, which is for the community. I believe that while life experience is a positive thing, it's not the only thing. My education experience, having a nonprofit, being a charter review board chairperson, learning how to run meetings is also just as valuable. I believe that being attentive to the public being open and willing to hear them, even if they bring stuff to you that you don't agree with or you may not like, is critical. Our public and our citizens are our greatest asset in this community, and I will always work to uphold that and uphold you as citizens of this county, and I would be honored uh, to have your vote in November. All right, so just a, a little final, that was almost like a a two for Stumper. Now I'll just do a final comment as we round it out. We really do appreciate all your time today. Some really great questions. I didn't get to all of them, but nearly all of them. Um, and we've got a poll coming up in just a, um, just a minute. We'll pop that up. But just a final comment 
um, that you all can share with the group again as to why they should vote for you and Commissioner Biedert. Um, please go ahead. Well, I think uh, I have been around a long time and I think for people, most people probably have already made a decision about me one way or the other. So I'm not gonna try to convince you. I'm just gonna thank the people of Sarasota County for electing me over and over again to so many positions. And I hope I have not disappointed and I am proud of the things that I've accomplished in those various positions, things like passing the no texting while driving bill, uh, extending foster care from age 18 to 21. I call that my obituary bill. Nothing is ever gonna be more important than that. So in each job that I've held, I have something I can point to, including building the school that Corey Hutchinson currently works at, Laurel McComas. <laughs> So my, I think my name's in the office there. So I just want to thank the public for supporting me. And I hope I haven't disappointed you over the years. And this will be the final race I ever have. So I'm getting a little sentimental about it. So thanks for all the years. Oh, wow, that's terrific. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Dieter. And Corey, any final comments? Thank you, Commissioner, for the place of employment. I appreciate it very much. It is time that we look forward to what the future of Sarasota County is gonna look like. And it is time, as I said, to pass that torch on to the next generation. There are many times where you will hear about life experiences and, and guiding principles that we all have, but government wasn't just for those who had already held positions or who had so much political experience. It was for the average citizen who felt like he or she could do something good for the community and wanted to run and go for it. It was for that person that will listen to his or her constituents and ensure that their voices are upheld. And those are the values that I carry with me all the time. And those are the values that I will use when voting. It's a tough job, no doubt. There's nothing easy about being an elected official. And I know that just from being around elected officials, um, not yet being one myself. But you have to have people who will uphold integrity and also vote in the best interests of the communities. Through experience, there is always good experience, but there's also bad experience. And I appreciate Commissioner Dieter's service, but we've seen the destruction of the unemployment system that she had a hand in doing. We have seen the issues with the redistricting that she was instrumental in, and it's time to move forward. It's time for a new leader. And it's time for somebody who doesn't answer to development or special interests, but somebody who answers solely to you, the citizens of this county. I'll use my education experience, my community service experience to do my best and ensure that I bring honor and uh, graciousness to this position that you are proud of me. And hopefully I will earn your vote on November 3rd or through vote by mail or early voting beforehand. Reach out to me anytime, Hutchinson2020.com. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. Thank you both so much. You've got a, um, a survey up in front of you right now. If y'all could go ahead and just pop that in, pop your answers in so we know a little bit more about how well we did and where you all stand on which candidate you, um, you made your decision yet. I want to thank um, everyone for joining us today, this afternoon, particularly. Thank you, Commissioner Dieter. Thank you, Corey Hutchinson, for joining us, for um, engaging and illuminating to us um, areas in which you stand, and both of you should be commended, certainly, um, Commissioner Dieter, for your longstanding, distinguished um, service to our community, and certainly, Corey, for your very um, admirable um, effort in coming forward as a new fresh blood. So to both of you all, kudos um, on a job well done. We thank you all for joining us today. I think the poll is going to end. Um, and on that note, let's see, we've got, we did it. Oh, we actually helped people learn some more things about you all. So that was good. So that's a win. And it looks like 13% of the folks today are still undecided. So um, I know that's always kind of surprising. So there you go. Um, happy Thursday to everyone. And on that note, have a great afternoon, Sarasota. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank, Thank you, you very much.